if there was something else I could do, like I would, I would do it. Like you know, this game, this game is my side hustle. Like I would like that in some ways because it takes the pressure off it. But I, I think that people's response in that way that you're saying of like, oh, you know, you're so lucky, or like, I wish I could do that, is probably about that that those deeper register feelings. Um that we necessarily learn to numb ourselves from because to go into them when you don't have the space in your life to really process them or access them or use them in a creative way, it it can become exhausting. The numbness that we need in order to flourish and, and um, be able to survive in our lives can actually become extremely exhausting. And then to face that, often it takes, you know, the reflection of another person's life in order to see some desire in ourselves that we've stifled or frustrated. Welcome to Why Not Both, the podcast all about how our multiple passions shape our identity and our lives. I'm your host, Pam Schaefer, and our producer is Laura Studeris. This season, we are brought to you by Under the Radar magazine. If you like what you hear, you can head over to our Patreon to support us directly and get transcripts of all of our episodes, or you can come hang out with us on your favorite social media platforms, where we can be found under WNB, the podcast. This week, we welcomed the wonderful wordsmith, Kay Tempest, to our show. I hope that you enjoy our chat. Welcome to Why Not Both, where we're filled with moderate amounts of chaos. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I used to start the podcast by asking people what they did and what a better question was to ask. And I feel as though that might be relevant again now that we are shifting into like a whole other dynamic post the chaos dynamic. I'm like, Mm -hmm. I guess what is a better question than what do you do upon first meeting someone? Yeah, I I usually would ask like what like I would either ask like how was your day? What have you been doing today? Or I would ask like what are you into? What do you love? kind of thing. Uh I find like what do you do? It's really loaded. It's it's kind of about it can stratify or seek to classify a person through ideas of the worth of their labor in a particular mode and sometimes it can minimize people's experience and sometimes it can feel really like shocking it's a shocking question sometimes people sometimes people ask me that I feel really like I don't know what to say like I don't know why they're asking I don't know what to say you know um so normally I just say like yeah how was uh, how was your day or like if if it was the kind of place where it you know there's a bit more of a hangout on the cards you probably ask someone what they're into Hmm. but then that's quite a loaded question as well because how deep do you go like how do you answer that like you know if you're somewhere <laughs> else, I feel similarly I like what you said a lot about that you can accidentally stratify people or minimize their experience or kind of almost like what I was visualizing in my head is almost like reducing people into like layers like I was thinking of like the strata of like earth layers it's like oh you're this layer oh you're this layer oh you're this and you're like no 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 I'm the whole planet like there's a whole planet in me. Um, but then, like you said, you don't know if when you first meet someone, you're like, do you want the whole planet or did you want a slice of the planet? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's, I, it's kind of awkward. I just associate those questions with just like awkward moments or like, like conversation, you know, like, uh, like a flood lit conversation too bright like not, <laughs> you know like not cool just like oh, what like oh I've got a... there's rules that I don't fully understand you know like that's always how it feels like you know yes yes that it's like did everybody get the playbook to this and I simply did not yeah that's, not, <laughs> that's like my main go-to sensation is that yeah yep yep it was very strange when I started talking to people in uh, like late 2019, early 2020, people did say similar things to the stratification and the reduction, especially like you had said to people's labor. 
And then as time has gone on over the last few years, people have been even more like vehement about that, that it's like we are so much more than our labor, as was demonstrated by the fact that either some of us couldn't do our labor during this time or our labor completely radically shifted because of all the circumstance of the gestures to everything. And so it kind of was almost like it's a silly question to ask people, I feel like these days to be like, what do you do? Or also how are you? Like when someone asks me how, how I am, I think of that gif of like, how am I? (laughs) I feel like what, what I don't don't understand about that question of like, what do you do? Because what, what does it, is it like, what do you want to do with your time? Or is it like, how do you make your money? Like, that's the question, isn't it? How do you make your money? Like, what's your primary function? And how am I supposed to engage with it? Because is it of value? <laughs> like, you know, in mm-hmm. in this mysterious game that we all play that none of us enjoy, like, how am I supposed to interact with these stratifications? And like, I remember because I, you know, I do lots of different things. So as well as being a musician, I'm also a published writer of different kinds of things. So I started to have to hang out in situations where I felt extremely uncomfortable. I didn't know the rules, like, but I was constantly like, Uh, learning as I went along so something like fiction publishing is a different culture to something like poetry publishing but every now and then I'd find myself at like a literary event and my girlfriend at the time um my partner at the time they had they worked in like a in like a bar and they sometimes did some cleaning in this place and they so they had lots of different jobs but they also were a singer they're a fantastic artist they're like a a healing practitioner they had they were many 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 things but then when you're in an environment like that and someone's saying what do you do well I make I make coffee in a bar like I don't what do you want me to say like it's it felt so like reductive and judgmental especially in that situation when you're dealing with people from very different walks of life you know mm-hmm. who have there's so much judgment in a in a space where you feel like I have to impress or am I really meant to be here or Am I going to lose everything if I tell these people the truth about really how, like, how <laughs> my life? Like, I just remember that being on the lookout for that question because I knew it made my partner feel uncomfortable as well. And I remember just like, it's taught me a lot about how people could be insensitive to other people's experience if they didn't realise that a question like that isn't the kind of question that everybody wants to be asked, you know, like. Yeah. Um, yeah. And speaking of, like you had said, like navigating different spaces, that there are different expectations within those different spaces and something that in one space might be seen as valuable and another space might be devalued. And so you're like, which facet of myself do I show? And Or like it, the worst part of it would be like, oh, interesting. You have like, you know, like you work in a bar. Like, oh, how interesting. Like, it's like, just get, get off, just get off. Like, go away, you know, like. I don't know. It's just it's if the whole thing felt weird because it's like yeah it's it's the least important part of a person's reality like how we what we have to do to be able to like function and survive the things that we do to thrive are not the things that we do to survive really unless you're very extremely lucky and you like you get to the point where you can be occupied like by the thing that is your vocation but even so, like, it's a weird question. If someone asks me, what do you do? And I say I'm a writer or I'm a musician, then it's like this whole other awkward thing of like, well, really? Are you really? Do you make money? Or can you pay your rent? Like, And then it's yeah. going to be... Then I have to make a decision about, well, do I just say, like, am I going to go into this with them? Like, yeah, I can, like, or no. or And then it's like, have I heard of you? What have you done? You've got to prove it. So I just, if I'm ever in a conversation with somebody, I just, I, I am... Um, yeah, sometimes I just resort to fantasy. It's just easier. I'll just say, like, you know, I oh, won't tell them what I ha- what I do because it's. I'd rather not. I'd rather ask about their life, I suppose, in a different way than get into that awkward phase of like. The weird exercise in ego, which is like. You know. Oh yeah, I'm. I'm doing it. You know, like. Yeah, like, and and I think that artistry and writing and music, those are the. Those are the fields that spring to mind. I can't imagine asking someone to prove to me that they were a dentist or something like that. I wouldn't be like, all right, show me. Have I heard of you? Have I heard of your dentistry? 
<laughs> like, what are the reviews saying for your fillings? Like, yeah. Yeah. I pull up your Yelp reviews. <laughs> yeah. well, I suppose there's something to it because everybody is creative. Everybody has creativity and everybody probably at some point uh, dreams of having a deeper access to their creativity if they're not able to live a life that um, enables them to do so. And I don't mean creativity, like making art. I just mean the part of us all that is creative, which we all have. Mm. And so, and so, there's some. If you're an artist, you're you have to expect to engage with that part of people because that that is where this all comes from, you know. Yeah, there's there's almost I don't know how to describe it. Like aspirational is the wrong word for it. I was like, you as a wordsmith might have a word spring to mind, but it's it's that reaction of when people you haven't seen for a while see you and they realize that you are an artist in the way of we've read the Yelp reviews of the dentist. And, and they say things like, I wish I could do that. Or, oh, wow, you're so lucky. Or things like that. Mm-hmm. There's got to be a German word for it, for like the path that I didn't take that maybe I didn't even like, but I want to take anyway because I saw someone else take. <laughs> I think it's like, I think it's actually just a resonance about recognition and and then I would say also deeper beneath that it's about engagement with the deeper register stuff of life, which as artists we that's that's our bread and butter, that's where we live. Like we live in that deeper register. And there is um there is like a, a extreme joy in that place and deep, deep deep despair and you know this is where we live like this is our lives and often it's not a choice you you, there is nothing else there's nothing else you can do I I genuinely feel like if there was something else I could do like I would I would do it like you know this this is my side hustle like I would like that in some ways because it takes the pressure off it but I, I think that people's response in that way that you're saying of like, oh, you know, you're so lucky or like, I wish I could do that is probably about that, that those deeper register feelings um, that we necessarily learn to numb ourselves from because to go into them when you don't have the space in your life to really process them or access them or use them in a creative way, it it can become exhausting. The numbness that we need in order to flourish and, and um, be able to survive in our lives can actually become extremely exhausting. And then to face that, often it takes, you know, the reflection of another person's life in order to see our, some desire in ourselves that we've stifled or frustrated. But the reality of what it is to, like, to really live in that place, uh, I think, like, yeah, it, it, each life, all all lives are exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes I he said something that really resonated of the it's almost like the awareness of the numbness it's like Mm -hmm. once you become aware of the numbness the numbness becomes a problem in a way because if you're not aware that you're numb to things well you're numb to things so you're like all right we're cruising along we're treading water but if all of a sudden you see someone swimming and you're like hang on a minute that's another I could be swimming then yeah. putting water bothers you. Whereas before, yeah. if you're just, you know, you're just doing your little froggy kick and hanging out and not drowning, you're like, okay, cool. Yeah, we got this. Yeah, but I, I believe it's like, it's a belief of mine that every single human being is, is innately creative. That we, we were created. We, we, we seek to create. Like, this is, this is the life force. Creativity is like, it's life force. So if you think about that being the innate calling in a person to make of something, you know, to, maybe I, I mean maybe that isn't the case. That's just what that's that's something that I feel because I've because of who I've been around or the way that I grew up or like what I learned like from just being around people. But in a lot of cases, that the creativity is like stifled, like literally like stamped down by life, you know smothered strangled like made impossible so there's also all that going on you know when people are like oh wow you you make music like it's like a call from the soul isn't it of like yeah you do the thing like you live in that place because I feel like everybody has that place 
everybody has the creativity and it's like it doesn't you don't have to be I wrote a whole book about it on connection I don't necessarily think you have to be engaged with like an artistic practice to feel your creativity or to access it you, it's anything that absorbs you takes your attention it's any act of love that is that is creativity and um like life is like you know beautiful absolutely extraordinary and often relentless cruel like makes no sense terrible things happen to people and like and yet this this spirit survives in people this like ability to connect with other people's creative output and a desire to connect with your your own so it's like it's one of the for me it's like the one of the deepest mysteries and just mm. like the profound beauty as well you know I agree with you. I have, I've actually never met somebody who does not have an ounce of creativity in them. And I think in some ways there are people who want to reside there. Some people it does, like you said, it gets stamped out of people. And then there are some people that wouldn't actually want to live in the life of an artist, because as you described, there's a lot of extremes and some people actually don't want that. And I'm like, hmm, I respect it. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I don't know anybody, especially, I mean, I might, you know, have similar biases where it's like, I've worked with children throughout my life. Like I work as a therapist, I'm an artist. It's like, so I am surrounded by people who are like deep in the feels. Um, but at the same time, I'm also friends with like, one of my good friends is an accountant. Uh, we don't usually think of accountants as very creative people, but his home is like filled with like stained glass and it's purple and he painted his patio purple. He calls it the purple palace. Like he just went all in and like seeing that it's like, that's his creative expression where he decided to have the purplest house that was ever purple. Hmm. And I'm like, excellent. Like, I think everybody does have their thing. Like whatever that thing is, there is that thing in people that it's like, you can either express it, you know, in a way professionally, or you can express it like that. Like, it is really fun when I get to be like, hey, do you want to go to the Purple Palace? Um, <laughs> and, and like you said, there's, there's this innate, innate thing. And I do wonder why in a way, like, we want to stamp it out when it is the thing that often brings so much beauty to the world. I'm like, why do we do that to people? Could we maybe do less of that? Perhaps? I think it's like, it says a lot when you encounter somebody whose life has been like, you know, as hard as lives are, but that who has maintained a total dedication to their creativity or to, or to the, or to practice of like some sort, like, for example, like I have someone in my mind, I'm thinking of an actor, like a deep, deep actor dedicated to the craft. It's an impossible job to get into, like, you know, so much rejection. Her life has been, like, you know, a life, a, a very tough life, like. And yet she, what she receives from entering into stories of other people's lives, of thinking about how to take on character, of thinking about writing, she loves writing, like, she loves the the thing of like reading in text the expression of like these truths that are so evasive and then you, you read it in a line and it just pins it right down. You say, this is what I've been saying that without being able to say it, you know? And it's like, I feel like it's a bit of a, it's a, it's like, it's a fallacy. It's not true. Like we, we mustn't believe the fact that like art or creativity is like this kind of privileged space for like, I don't know, certain people that, 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 that know the lingo, like the way that I have experienced creativity is this is like, this is life-saving stuff. This will transform a person's life. If you've been in the gutter and everybody thinks that you should be dead and yet you've had this thing, which is, I don't know, like a love for, in this case, the theater, acting, then that that's like, you jump in that stream and you swim and it'll take you, like, it'll get you out. Like, so... I don't know, like, in my experience of growing up as well, music, it was it was so creative and everything else was so destructive. And it was like, mm -hmm. go go there, go to that creative place because that's that's life. That's what mm -hmm. that's got that's gonna keep you alive. Like that's it. Like that is the point. That's what I'm saying about it being the life force. So like the people that I know that love music or that love poetry or that you know, that have this yearning to connect with their creativity, 
It's like they've escaped that thing of having it stamped out of them. They're kind of they're like enigmas, you know. They haven't become bitter. They haven't become. They have, you know. I don't know. It's I have. I've known a few people like that. So my experience of it is that my belief is strong in the power of it because I've known. I've seen a few examples of. Um. Yeah, like the epiphany of yeah. what it means to have creativity. Well. And- hearing what you said about that it's almost like music was like the light music was the thing that counteracted all the destructive forces that's fascinating that it's like that you held on to that life raft and then it sounds like then like there was music and then it sounds like then there was writing and then there there was all these things that it sounds like once you were on that life raft all these other I was just like life rafts of life rafts I was just like were they cool little buoys that like you hopped onto (laughs) it was like there was this you know (laughs) sounds like it opened up this entire world of creation to you because you are creative in multiple spheres which I find really fascinating like that's another thing that for me at least I think is interesting is when people are like oh you can only be creative in this one way um that to me is kind of counterintuitive I was like well of course it makes sense that if you create in one way you're going to want to create in another way too like it's the same force it just takes on a different format um Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was curious what that was like. If music was like your start, what opened up kind of the other avenues to you? Well, I was, it was lyricism. I began mm-hmm. rhyming and making, I love music and I thought I was, I'm gonna, I was kind of making beats as a kid. I, before I started making my own lyrics, it was musical, my connection with creativity and then when I I was writing privately I was writing and writing and writing but it was private it was just what I did to kind of pull myself back from the brink it was like my it was just this thing that I've always had since I was a kid that I I would write but I didn't associate that with anything that I I would ever share with anybody it was never Mm -hmm. for anybody else I never had a desire for it to be seen or read by anybody and um I was like, my my kind of best friend, he was a drummer and he we made beats together. I'd like sit around with him. And one day he just said, you know, you got to find your own thing. And I was like, what's my own thing? Like, what, what, is it, what does that mean? Because I couldn't play like him or, I don't know, like, I suppose he was being generous in his spirit or something. I don't, I don't really know. He, it was probably for him, it was just a throwaway comment. But for me, I really, I took it on board. And I thought, well, maybe this stuff that I do privately in my notebooks Maybe that's my thing. And it took a few months of me just just getting closer to the idea that actually I was going to start speaking these words. Mm. And then, um, yeah, I had lots of friends that were MCs and rhyme. They used to rhyme. And one day I just, they, it couldn't stay in anymore. I just, I started. I started speaking out loud. I, started, I went to a few ciphers and events and... And so from that moment, probably the first time I ever rapped in front of an audience, um, I, I suddenly had a focus in my life that I hadn't had before. And I became obsessed, like deeply obsessed, fixated. There was nothing else. The rest of the world disappeared into creativity, into this thing, this <laughs> rush of like the words that come out, what happens to the body, what happens to the mind, what happens to the room. And the musicality of language was, I was obsessive about it. I wanted to like, you know, I'd always been interested in lyrics and how they were constructed. I used to write down the lyrics from my favorite albums, my favorite rappers and like like look at the words on the page and think about how they related to each other. And, and then it took years of me doing that, of rhyming, thinking I was gonna, you know, I don't know what I wanted. I just, it, it was an obsession. I started, I was rapping, that was my thing. Yeah. It wasn't until I was like 21 that I discovered this spoken word poetry thing because a friend took me to a slam and said, hey, if you do your lyrics without any music, you could win a hundred pounds. So like that's, that's how <laughs> I never took myself to be a poet. I never understood that that was what I was doing, but other people would tell me, hey, you're a poet. And I didn't understand it. But then I, then I met a few poets and I... Um, I started to consider myself that way. I started to think about what happens to the lyrics without music. Mm-hmm. I started to think about storytelling. 
and a couple of years later somebody had seen me you know I was gigging all the time it was I was I dedicated my life to it I was doing four or five shows a weekend and oh wow yeah yeah I was busking I was like it was my life I wanted it I wanted it really really bad and um somebody that was a a, a theatre director in a new writing theatre company approached me because of he'd seen me doing shows and said I you know I think that you you're telling stories in your poems in your rhymes mm. like I think that you should write a play and he offered me a commission to to write a play and then that was the beginning of that's a really long-winded answer but that was the beginning of me understanding um through the application of struggle uh that actually my ideas could come out in different ways yeah so, yeah, and that when I after I got through that process of writing my first play, wasted, everything changed. My mind had just opened up. Like there was new, there was like a new pathway, and it was called dialogue. And there was a new pathway, and it was called plot. And then there was like structure, and and I've just been when once I realised that was the case, suddenly it was like all the all of the gates had been taken away, and there was just there was no boundary to it. It was like the only boundary to the creativity were the the practical boundaries of form that mm -hmm. as an artist I became hungry for. Like what does this form do to the idea? Like what what is a scene? Like what is a poem? What is a rhyme? What is a song? And then and then it was like I just had um an un an unquenchable thirst really for like experimentation. And that's beautiful that someone uh... As you said, like sometimes we only recognize our experience when they're reflected in another person, whereas another person saw that saw that seedling in you and was like, oh, let's water that. Yeah, I had experimented with like writing plays in rhyme, like verse plays and things like that, but not 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 properly, not. Not in the way that that was like a supported. Um. It was proper, like it was real. I got mm -hmm. there was a writing room I could use in town in in the center of London. Like I go up on my bicycle up to this like little writing room in Aldwych, and it just everything felt so like poignant. It was like this is it. This is the life. Like there's a big window here, and I just get to sit here. And I don't know. There was something about it all that made me feel like like I couldn't take a breath. It was like oh, it's yeah. happening. It's real. It's happening. <laughs> Well, yeah. someone gave you permission to do that in a way. Like, I remember a friend of mine in high school was very into into playwriting and in, uh, wrote a forty five minute play in verse, where the only uh, the only set dressing and, and prop was a red cloth that moved through the people within it. Um, and I remember thinking about like how did how did she think to do that? And and I asked her, and she had said that. It was another one of our teachers who had really liked the translation of Lysistrata that she put together, which was really fun. I got to play the narrator role in it uh, because the Greek chorus obviously has been lost. And so she wrote the role of narrator for me to explain all of the like classical references to the audience. And mm -hmm. he was just like, I love that you actually took um, this piece of, you know, like classic theater and did something different with it. And he was just like, what else do you do? And he just started chatting with her and she was just like, oh, well, I've been writing this poetry and blah, blah, blah. And like, same thing where it's like, he almost like gave her permission to do it. Cause he's like, oh, have you combined your poetry with your love of theater? And she was like, no, mm. yes. <laughs> like it was like, it was like mm. that someone saw that and was able to see that within her and that kind of like sprung forth. Um, and I didn't know that that's why she wrote it until she told me that it, it, it was the same. She and I had the same art history teacher, wonderful teacher. Um, and it was him who had said that. And I was like, oh, no way. I was just like, that's so cool. Um, but it's fascinating that it's almost like what people see in us that then creates this huge blossom. Yeah. And like, it's it's so strange and beautiful. And And you were also talking about that moment when you then were actually speaking the words in front of an audience and like all of like the physiological changes that happen and all the emotional changes. And I'm so curious, like what for you feels different when you're creating something that is going to be on like, a, like the physical written page versus when you're creating something that actually is going to be engaging in an audience. Like do those two things feel different for you? Yeah, definitely. The 
So, for example, the album that I've just made, when I'm uh, creating the record, it's like it's one self. It's like one version of my creative personality. It's the writer. Mm -hmm. And then when it's time to record the lyric, what I like to do is memorise the entire text and then do the the album lyric as one take. Um, because at that point, the performer side of myself needs to be engaged because there's things that performers know about text that writers themselves don't actually know. Because as you begin to internalise text, put it in the body, you make sense of it in a way that is it's unique to the experience of being the communicator, the performer, the reader. So what I can say is that I've got direct experience of knowing the two different approaches because the record is one thing the performance of the lyric is another and then actually I'm like two days away from leaving for a UK tour so I know so the record is done finished that's now it has its life and I'm not engaged with wherever it will end up like how beautiful it will go and do its thing but I will go on tour and have part of this collaborative moment of connection which will happen each night that we create this piece live as a performance on stage with an audience so I know that that's, that's a different thing. The way that I get myself ready for that is so different to like, well, for example, I'm working on a book of poems and it's like, yeah, it's a completely different headspace. Like I might, I'm chipping away at these poems, like one word at a time, thinking about the, the space they occupy on the page, the meter, the form the constraint and the push against the constraint and it's like it's so different to me like being in this kind of abstract moment of like in three days I'm gonna be there <laughs> like I'm strong enough like am I ready like I, like the nerves the excitement the idea that you you don't know what's going to happen until you're in the moment of performance and even then you don't know what's happening because it's you don't know where it's coming from you don't know what's going on I nearly black out every time I perform like mm. I'll watch like I don't know. It's not nervousness in the like sense of, I think I'm going to do something badly, but it's, it's like you just described where since you don't know what's going to happen. Mm. Yeah. But then when you're writing, you don't, you don't have that same experience. Oh. Right? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you're really present, like in the writing process, you're there. Right. So it's this, it, that's it. That's what I'm talking about. You have these yes. two, these two modes of like, yeah. Like what the audience or the experience of performance does to the body of the performer is different to like what the writer knows of the process does to, you know what happens to the body of the writer when you're in the room writing very different it's what came to mind was almost like I don't know if this resonates with you but like when I'm producing a song and putting it together and writing and it's like I'm building a bicycle and then when I actually perform it for people I'm riding the bicycle and my body knows how to ride a bicycle but I'm not thinking of the mechanics of riding a bicycle and or building a bicycle while I'm riding the bicycle mm. I'm riding the bike <laughs> like, and just trusting I put everything in place that the bike doesn't spontaneously fall apart <laughs> yeah that makes sense to me <laughs> <sighs> have you ever had the situation I was I was reflecting on something I wrote that like something looks really good on the page or sounds good in your head but then when you try to actually have it come out like it must be altered like that happens to me sometimes or something will look so beautiful or seem like it's going to sound beautiful and then I say it and it doesn't feel right in my mouth and I'm like oh no I gotta I gotta judge that I gotta shifty shifty yeah yeah it happens all the time um for example there's things that the eye will miss that mm -hmm. the the ear will not miss. Like I can look over a poem hundred times and think perfect, but then until I've memorized it and tried to speak it, there's things that the mouth just will not say because it's not right. It doesn't belong there. It shouldn't shouldn't be there. There's things that I just can't remember, like because it shouldn't be there. So I always say it a different way, and it's like the pro. For me, it's the final edit, like. Um, what the mouth will not like do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way of putting it or I I've noticed that when I actually sing I, I end up taking out almost all of my um all of my articles like whenever I'm writing I'm throwing just articles in all the time like thus and a's and ends and just just flinging them around and then when I try to sing it 
I end up just emitting them. And I don't know why I persist in writing them in lyrics, but mm. I love how you said that, that like the mouth just won't do it. <laughs> and the ear is like, nope, that's not necessary. It doesn't. Yeah. But like, I, it, it doesn't happen like until I've memorized the text, basically. It's like, it's so weird. Like I can, I can miss a repetition of the same word, like six lines apart. And I could have mm-hmm. I could have read that over fifty times. But by the time it gets to the stage where you're submitting it for a poetry book or whatever, you're like even lyrics in um in albums, which you've like by the time an album's out, you've fucking heard that lyric so many times. <laughs> <laughs> but then it's not until I'm memorizing it that I, that I realize oh I, that's the same word six lines later. It's so strange. And then you you can make all these little. Because what, for me, memorizing is a really important part of it because you, you create these like maps through. So mm-hmm. you have to really build these understandings of why one image moves to another or why one character leads to another. And that's what I mean about the writer. The, the writer doesn't even have access to that bedrock of information that the performer, the actor, like the speaker yeah. has to create. It's so interesting. Like, and even in the theater, when I've written plays, I'll be in the room with all the actors and I've created a world. Like I've made up, I've made up a world. Like it didn't exist and I've made it up. And then these actors are saying, so when my character was 17 and they moved from here to here and I'm like, fuck, I haven't like, sorry, I just swore twice as well, but sorry. You are all good. Swearing is totally allowed. (laughs) (laughs) You come up against this idea that the actors are, digging so deep into why their character is doing what they're doing in the present that they've created all this backstory. They want to know why on page two this happens and why on page 17 this happens. It seems to conflict it. And as the writer, you're like, well, I don't know. (laughs) 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 I don't know. I don't know. Like, as much as I possibly can, I'm thinking very deeply, obviously, all the time about why one character says this or another says that, but there's a certain level of, like, functionality that you need characters to do in order to carry the plot. Mm -hmm. But for, like, that's not actually... It's so amazing. Like, if once you've written the thing, the world underneath it that you had no part in creating, that is just implicit in all made-up worlds suddenly gets deeper and deeper and deeper. It just needs somebody to engage with it. That's why it's so beautiful and profound when somebody finds something in a poem I've written that it's just so resonant for them wherever they're at in their life, but it's because of the quality of their reading yeah. that creates the connection. It's not the quality of what I've put into the poem. It's the quality of what they have gone through in order to get something out of it. That's That's my take on it. I love that. It reminded me of two things. Like one, did you have this experience in school where you'd be asked to analyze a poem or a piece of literature and there was somehow in your teacher's mind the correct answer of the analysis? But in fact, it was a kaleidoscope of answers. Like if you asked everyone in the class what their read is of something, like you said, it's because of that emotional resonance. It's their life resonance. It's their you know, you've unlocked something for them. There's no right analysis when it comes to like a character's motivation, things like that. And I remember one of my teachers was so insistent that it's like, oh no, like we can tell exactly why characters do things. And I thought that was so silly. I was just like, you have very poor theory of mind if you think everybody has the same interpretation. Mm -hmm. Um, And it also reminds me of a friend of mine who's a TV writer. Um, that they would ask, we'd be watching TV together. We were quarantined together at the beginning of this whole experience because um, we we had a pod of friends that creatively co-worked and we just decided like, hey, if any one of us is sick, probably all of us are sick. And also we probably would work better as a team to not get sick. So for several months, we saw only each other. Um, It was the four of us. Um, But they did this exercise where they would have all of us watch the same show and discuss the emotions that we saw in other people in the show because as a writer they were like I will create these characters but other people are going to see different emotions in them and see different stories and they were like I'm curious what all of your stories were and I'd never been really in that kind of situation with someone who does write for tv and things like that that does create characters that then like you said the person that's embodying them it takes on like a whole other 
whole other life. And my friend was like, I want to know what people think of these different characters because I want to start thinking about that. I want to start thinking about possibilities. I want to be able to open things up for the actors that are actually going to be embodying these characters. Yeah, it's it's crazy because you you can never know. Like you put everything that you can into creating the characters. But like what it's it's about where a person is at while they're watching, what they need at that moment from whatever it is that they're watching, what they're going through in their life, personally, politically, socially, globally, what's happening, that will inform the way that whatever we're engaging with resonates with us. And the thing is, often we need something unreal, some fiction or other, like some created thing in order to have access to what is real. Because the real is so distorted, strange, like surreal, that to, in order to function and to get through it, like I said earlier, you know, there's a certain element of disassociation that we need to employ in order to just function with life. You, you can't really hold the reality of what is happening all the time in your head because you it's too much like it's too right. much how we've arrived here what this all is what it really means and then that links down and has effects on how we handle our own relationships the situations in our lives that happen etc and then sometimes it's like you just you don't you, you don't even know how you're feeling about something like some things are too big to know how you feel about them you can't you can't allow yourself to feel some things are just too frequent and then suddenly I find myself listening to the radio or reading a book or, and it's like when I really, I need what I need to access my feelings. Like, it's like, that's when I get it from somebody's creativity. Like I hear someone sing or I watch something on the TV and it's like, that's what I mean. It's got nothing to do with the work that's created really. And I know this and it's like, it enables me to feel more relaxed about the, the idea of exchange that happens when someone's like, I love your work or something like that, because mm. I know that's about where they're at, where they're at and what they took to the text. Because the profound moments that I've had with books of writers that I love, the writing has been incredible. And I, I've like, it's done something to me. It's unlocked something in me that needed unlocking and actually took me, it's a place in myself that I recognised. That was why it was profound. That's why I carry that book with me through my life. Mm. And so it's like, that's what I mean. Um, when you're watching something, like obviously there's the thrill of watching something that's like expertly crafted or experiencing some amazing piece of art. But the deep, deep resonance, that means that suddenly you're closer to your own life. Mm. Um, that's actually... Well, I understand it as being like a three-pointed circuit between the writer... <laughs> the reader and the work itself. So Ooh. it's like when this circuit is connected, when all three points are connected and, and burning with an equal power, that's when that's when you have connection. That's when you have the deep connection. Mm. So you need the writer, the thing they wrote, and the person who brings that thing to life to all be equally engaged um, for the thing to have life. That reminds me of the model of, of partnership that I remember I saw once. It was a triangle of companionate love, sexual love, romantic love. And it's like, depending on what kind of relationship you want, depends on how much those are lighting up. But yeah. it's that most relationships and partnerships contain one of, you know, kind of a configuration of that triangle. But that can cause conflict. Like say someone really wants a companionate style relationship. And what's really lit up is romantic for the other person and the other two are very dim lights. That's not going to be compatible. But once you get everybody, you know, kind of on the same vibrance of the triangle points, like same kind of thing where it's like, it's about what do you bring? And that's fascinating because it also strikes me of the idea of like a relationship can happen with like the right person at the wrong time. It's almost like if you encounter a piece of art at the time that you can't bring yourself to it, it might not hit in a way. Like it might not light up the right parts of the triangle. Yeah, yeah 100%. That's exactly how it is. I know it as well. When I'm listening to an album, and I know it's an amazing album, but it's, I'm, I'm just not there. Then what I, I can just, I know it now. It's like, I'm not where I need to be to even know how I feel about this. It's not, I'm not there. It's not doing it for me. I'm not doing it for it. Yes. Then it's yes. just like, cool, okay that's not for me right now. I'm not for that right now. That doesn't mean I'm not going to find it in five years time and be like, Oh my, this album. Wow. You know, it's like, 
so we have to in some sense like we have to dismantle the idea of like the genius maker, you know, like it's just, it's, it's all at odds with the reality of how creativity flows and how connection really works. Like, because like, for example, a piece of, you've got a piano behind you, Chopin, right? Mm -hmm. It's always the piece does, the piece of music doesn't change. Chopin is genius. Okay. But at some points in my life, I will listen to Chopin. I'll be reduced to a wreck, I'll be crying, I'll be in elation, I'd have found my soul recognised and I will feel myself closer to the essence of the universe. At other times I'll hear some Chopin and nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. and it, it's like that, it doesn't have, well it's actually the same thing as being on stage. Sometimes you go on stage and you're like delivered into this state of like pure connection. And other times you go on stage and you're just going through the motions and one moment is painfully slow leading into the next. And, you know, like or other times there's no time at all. It's like it's so mysterious. And I, th I feel like putting value on the on the worth of connection is. Um, it has been like it's like diminishes yeah. everybody's role in making it happen because it's so collaborative. Yeah, it reminds me of. Um... So I am from LA, so I feel like I can say dippy things like this. Do you meditate? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I haven't Excellent. meditated for a while because um, it's been a really, like, you know, when you get in a really busy time or the times when you need it the most sometimes is when you you can allow the practice to. to yes. But yeah, I yes. haven't been meditating, but I, I do, I use, I have, yeah, I understand meditation is a, is a very important practice. It reminds me of exactly that because the only form of meditation I found that I could actually sink into is transcendental meditation. I've tried like, cause everyone's always like meditate. It'll totally help with your ADHD. And I'm like, no, that's a double sided. I, I can't because of the, mm. um, <laughs> I'm like the brain spice. It makes it not possible. Um, but <laughs> But with this particular form, what I like about it is the philosophy that informs it that you just said, where it's like, because sometimes when I'm meditating, I have like a profound experience of sinking into myself and I access these wonderful ideas and it's like amazing. And other times I might kind of almost fall asleep. Other times I'm like, cool, I did the thing. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> like that's it <laughs> it's like but it's taught me to not be attached to like what's going to happen when I go into meditation which then like is really good practice for going into other things to just like go in with the expectation of like this thing is sure going to happen and that's about it <laughs> like it's not good it's not bad like it's just happening um and that I really quite liked because it slowed down my process of either having expectations of things or uh, like like you said, placing value upon things of either, oh, this is an amazing experience performing or, oh, since the experience I'm having right now performing isn't good, that means like all performing won't be good. Um, yeah. And so it, it stopped my brain from making those leaps as much. My brain still wants to make those leaps. Yeah. I just now can kind of like catch it by the color and be like, whoops, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's inspiring to hear. That's good to know. Yeah. I, I encourage I encourage everybody to to practice it because it's like it's taken a few years I would say mm. for my brain to for me to be able to get to just the catching it still wants to jump I don't know if maybe in a few years my brain won't want to jump as much that'll be interesting but at least I can get to the catching bit yeah yeah I think I think that's it I think that you if I understand you correctly I, I think that the brain will always jump the idea is that above the mind or the brain is consciousness or something and that, and that um yeah the spotting the the jumps and just being aware that's kind of what meditation is um seeking i, I don't know I'm, I'm not an expert but as in my understanding of it that's that's what it can offer like just um a perspective on the on the jump on the jumping mind you know that is like oh this isn't all there is there's actually I don't have to just like go with this all the time right um, I could I can observe this as it happens 
I've got ADHD as well. So I, I get it. Yes. I, was, <laughs> I always love when I'm talking to someone else who's neurodivergent. It makes me very, very happy. I was also researching for a long time. They wouldn't dual diagnose um, autism and ADHD. And for a long time, I was just like, but I do have like traits on the autism spectrum. Like, why can't you diagnose them? And now they've actually gone oopsie doodle. There's actually about a 60 to 80% overlap. Yeah. We just didn't feel like those two should, but, but we actually, and I'm like, mm, mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's so yes, it's, all, yes. Uh, it's, um, it's really, I love talking to people that uh, either have discovered they're like, oh, wait, I actually have these traits or wait, I actually resonate with this because I think that. I have a theory really about neurodiversity that it's like, we're supposed to all have these different kinds of minds because that way we can all harmonize together. If we all have the same kinds of minds, um, wouldn't work so well. Mm. Like if all of us were like, ah, yes, I can focus on farming. I will do the same thing every day. I will do it in the same pattern. I'll do it the exact same way. It's just like, cool. Then who are the people that are going to go out and like be able to spot the berries amidst the wilderness on like a three-day trek? Mm where are the berries going to come from? Um, and so I think about it that way, where it's like, I love talking to people whose minds work outside of what people have defined as the norm, because I don't even think it's the norm. I'm like, no, I think there's supposed to be multiple ways of the waves, all the little cogs turning in here. Yeah, I think that, I think that understanding that not not get not quite getting the rules that everyone else seems to be playing by or just not quite ever feeling um part of the thing that seems to be happening which is called life that everyone seems to be so uh like involved in in a certain way once uh i realized that my brain was was a particular kind of brain it just it made me realize that i wasn't broken or that I, it it wasn't that i didn't it wasn't like I was being like willfully um, different or like not, yes. not, you know, it just, my brain is a different kind of brain. And sometimes I think we can like over pathologize and over identify or that there seems to be a tendency to like name, like name things to a point of like limitation like we said at the beginning of this conversation like what are you like what do you do like and like as helpful as it's been getting different diagnoses for different things within my like the way that I function in my life it has been really helpful but at the same time I believe that people are many things and I I would like to like link with the parts in people that are all the same, the common parts mm-hmm. in all of us, not the parts of us that are kind of at loggerheads or are different or, you know, my particular set of neuroses or my particular brain, the way it functions or my particular identities. Um, they're important to me and they help me understand myself. And also they can help me find community and kinship with other people that have similar experiences. But I think because I'm a poet and poetry deals with the eternal things, the things that are bigger than my experience or yours, like huge, huge things that go all the way back to the beginning of time and hopefully will, you know, continue forever. Like these are the things yeah. that this is where poetry takes us. Because of this stuff, I'm I feel like I'm constantly looking for as well as what helps me understand myself, but what helps me kind of disappear from it to connect mm-hmm. with other people in this place that is eternal. I love that idea of finding the self to kind of dissipate and to become kind of like that harmonious feeling that I was, that was coalescing in my mind. It's like the, oh, I can find out about me specifically and delve into that in order to zoom back out to like the universal. Yeah. I just wish that like people that weren't neurotypical, like had the understanding that that's also just the way their brain works. Like that's not just that's not the be all and end all and that and we divert from it so we're different like I just I I I I think that that is happening that there is some consciousness shifting around the idea that there is no like type a person like you know just because like that's how it is for you 
that doesn't make it the norm like that's that's just one type you're one type I'm one type like yeah I, I, and I think that obviously there's more people that are neurotypical than there are that are neurodivergent but um it just it, it would be amazing to for someone to be like oh hey yeah my brain works like this it's it's neurotypical (laughs) (laughs) oh hey my brain works like this I've got ADHD like sorry 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 you know yes I I do my best to normalize exactly what you're just saying that for a long time like not knowing the vocabulary for it because and I, I say this to my clients even as well about like diagnosis is only so useful as it is that you can you know, utilize tools or find that feeling of self-acceptance, things like that. But it's not necessarily useful to be like, oh, this is my label. It's more just like, well, what does that open up for you if the if you have the vocabulary for it? So now, like I used to be really embarrassed, like telling people about things that happened because of my ADHD. Um, and I used to, you know, be labeled spacey, dreamy, like all those different words that they use for, you know, girls with ADHD. Um, and so now I'm like, oh, I sometimes, you know, like I'll explain to people, like I have time blindness. So I'm like, I'll sometimes use a timer. Or if you see me looking at the clock, it's not because I'm attempting to be rude. It's because I don't have an internal sense of time. I'll be like, I have a great sense of direction, can find anything in a new city. I got this. <laughs> like My own city. Did I find a hidden freeway entrance I hadn't taken in a decade, like two days ago when I was driving home from a show with my boyfriend? Yes. Was he impressed? Yes. He's like, how did you even know about that? I was like, (laughs) so like really strong on one, it rolled zero on the other. And so I'll just be really forthcoming about that now to be like, Hey, like, this is why I'm doing these things. Um, and if people want to judge me for that in a way, I'm like, well, that's on you. Like I'm explaining my process to you. I'm giving you the instruction manual on myself. And if you don't want to take that instruction manual, well, that's unfortunate (laughs) that I find that most people react like, oh, that helps me understand this better. Like one of my friends was, she had thought that I was late all the time because like, I just didn't want to hang out with her. And I'm like, no, it's because I don't know how long things take. So I try to smush too many things in a row. And then I make myself late. It's kind of embarrassing. And she was like, oh, I'm sorry. That sounds like it sucks. And I was like, it does. (laughs) I was like, I'll make an extra effort not to do that when I'm getting together with you and set more alarms. But please know that if I am late, it is not a reflection on you. Mm -hmm. And so like being able to be like, open about it does sometimes help and I think that in a way that can change the dialogue around some of the stigma of it or like you said there's no like prototype of a person Mm. (laughs) like there's no like here's the platonic ideal Mm. like and so yeah I at least have been trying my very best and it, it's mortifying sometimes to like tell people things like I sometimes don't remember to eat until I'm too hungry so I have a list of foods on my refrigerator Mm. (laughs) <laughs> because then there is no cook there is only eat at that point it is too late <laughs> and so explaining things to people in that way they're like oh okay and then it can sometimes help other people either recognize they have similar things and they can do things differently or reflect on like oh that thing's really easy for me but something else is actually really difficult um because everyone can relate to the feeling of, I thought I did the thing well, I failed to do the thing. Should I hide? (laughs) (laughs) So yes, it's interesting also to think about neurodivergence in like the creative spheres, because so far I have definitely met people through the podcast who are neurotypical and creative But I'm very curious about like the overlap between ADHD, autism, like all of the nice fun brain spice flavors (laughs) and (laughs) and creativity, because I find that people who who do have that tend to be in um, more than one creative field, which I find fascinating. But a lot do exactly as you described, where it's like you really go down that hyper focus, like when you were describing your your focus on on language and the form of words and things like that, that we have this incredible ability to hyper-focus on something like that, but then our hyper-focus may shift. It might not be our hyper-focus for our lives. Mm. Um, so yeah, I don't yeah. know. I found that like switching between the forms, like I'm always working on four or five different projects at once, like always. There's a novel, a play, a book of poems, an album, 
always at the same time and it might take five or six years for these things to come to fruition but in my head I'm carrying them around all together all the time and moving focus from one to the other stops me from becoming exhausted or or frustrated with one but then things like anything anything that falls outside of that hyper fixation it's just impossible I can't do it I don't know yes. how I'm gonna do it I can't do it I can't like as you say everything about this kind of time blindness and then I, I just thought you know because there's a mythology around an artist where it's like oh maybe I'm just like a flaky artist and maybe I just don't value anything else like you know because people put this thing on you of like well if you can't function I can't function in the real world but like I'm doing really well in this world that I've created um that is like well, maybe I've had to create this because of my ADHD, because there was no, I couldn't function in the real world, but suddenly I knew that if I could just throw everything at, um, you know, like, if I could put all of my powers behind my creativity, which was a place where I felt like I understood the rules, I got it, like, it was a, it's a kind of place of enchantment, but also it's a totally safe environment, because yeah, it's like, it's mine, I get it, it's for me, like, I, I don't know, and so... I don't think that if my brain hadn't been the way that it is, I don't, I don't, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have discovered what I discovered of, of my creativity. Yeah. I think it would have been, there wouldn't have been a requirement in the way there was, but maybe it's like, you know, it could be many things. I've thought about it. How, why did I throw myself so fully into it? It could be the way my brain is. It could be being trans, you know, and my body being such a site of difficulty and pain and creativity being such a beautiful place. It could just be that, I, you know, I loved it. I, I fell in love. I fell in love. I fell in love with words. I don't know why, but it, it continues to sustain me. And, and like, it's so funny, like, learning about things like ADHD because just hearing you talk about it, it just gives me this feeling of relief because it's, like, um, it enables me to smile at things that have been extremely frustrating and upsetting in in my experience because it's like why why am i why am i like this why and it's caused like, it's caused relationships to like break down it's caused problems like in my life and it, and then just hearing somebody talk about it who's got a handle on it and is able to say to people hey the reason that i'm always late is this or like that thing about the food the list of foods on the fridge it just makes me think like it's possible not not only to like like you're saying about meditation to get some perspective to cope but also to like to enjoy to enjoy a brain like this yeah it's a wild ride in a brain like this but it's the ride we're on <laughs> yeah that's it, this is it. It's... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh I was like, this, uh, this warms my heart. And I was like, I want to keep talking, but I looked at the time and then I looked and saw there's a message in the chat and I was like, oh no, the time blindness, <laughs> it's taken us. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so funny. <laughs> uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm so glad yeah. that we got to so much like time zones and traveling and I was like ha, yeah ha, but we did it <laughs> thank you oh thank you so much I hope that your tour goes phenomenally like even now I'm feeling like in my body I'm like oh going on tour in a few days what the hell? yeah yeah I need to work out how to pack a bag and all that stuff it's been a while I've got, I got my <laughs> when it comes to that <gasps> oh my gosh oh my gosh yeah, I can't wait I'm going on tour it's going to be amazing thank you thank you for hanging out with me and um... thank you thank you again for listening to this episode of why not both if you liked what you heard please make sure to like us and subscribe to us on your preferred podcast platform you can also come hang out with us on social media we are at wnb the podcast both on instagram and on twitter this season, we are brought to you by Under the Radar magazine. Under the Radar is a nationally distributed print, music, and entertainment magazine and website. You can find them at www.undertheradarmag.com and feel free to support them on Patreon. Extra special thanks to our producer, Laura Studeris, who is literally a rock star. 
Thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you next episode. 